Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. That's awesome. <laughs> it's okay to laugh at that. That's us, right? Hey, my name is Dustin Pete. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. It's my honor to be uh, with you today um, to speak to you uh, about what that video kind of set us up with, our words. And so uh, what I want us to walk away with today is the better understanding of the things that we say and why we say it. And, and it's so funny to watch a video like that, whether you're a Christian and you go, uh, I've been guilty of that. Anyone in here say those things? Anyone have a word that somewhere in that video that like, I use that word on a regular basis and I never understood how weird or funny it sounded until you showed me a video of, of someone saying that word. Or maybe you're not a Christian in this room, and you have Christian friends, and you're like, that's why they're weird. They, they talk like that. And uh, I don't understand anything that they're saying, and I don't know what they're inviting me to, or what we're doing, or where we're going, or what it's about. Um, but what I want us to understand here today is that the words that we, the words that we use are, are super important, and they will paint a picture of the life that we live. So we can watch a video like that, uh, a video that I show all my friends. If I, if I have a friend who hasn't seen that video, I make certain as soon as possible they see that video um, because I think it's hilarious and we should laugh at ourselves. Um, but the way that we live, uh, the words that we use um, will ultimately determine the life that we live. And that's our big idea today. And so I want to share that with you right out the gate. You can understand by looking at that video uh, the life that those guys live, right? You can understand, even if you're not a Christian, you can look at that and go, okay, I get it. Those are Christians, and they kind of live in that world, and that's the way that they choose uh, to live their life. And the only reason we know that is the words that they use. They weren't sitting in a church. They were talking about church things, and they were using church language. And so our big idea today, uh, if you take nothing else away take, away, take away this today, and that is that the words that we choose determine the way that we live. The words we choose determines the life we live. Sorry, the, the words we choose determines the life we live. So my wife and I um, are still pretty new to the area. We moved here uh, about seven or eight months ago in March. I'm not real good at math on the spot. Um, so however long March was ago. Uh, we, we moved here um, from Indiana where we had spent the last 10 or 11 years in ministry. Uh, and Indiana, if you've ever been out there, is a strange place. Um, it's super flat. There's not a whole lot to it. There's not a whole lot of diversity. You kind of see what you get. If you see one person, you kind of know, okay, I've seen all of Indiana. Um, and before that, um, we lived in downtown Chicago, which is super diverse. Uh, we're both born and raised in southern Virginia, so not too far from here. So we've kind of been around, and we've seen some different cultures, and we've seen some different people. But uh, when we moved here in March... Um, we noticed that this place is different. <laughs> is anyone, like, not from here and they kind of transplanted in? Anybody? Okay. So if you're from here, we love you. And <laughs> just know that before I say what I'm about to say. But if you're, if you're a transplant, meaning you're not from here and you kind of get here, you kind of know... Glen Burnie in Central Maryland, it's, it's different, right? Uh, and what you're thinking when I say that and the laughter that you had when you said that, you know, okay, nothing wrong with it. Just different. And uh, the things that you're thinking of are all things that, that, that we've experienced as, as we've lived here. But I can tell you the one thing that I've noticed more than anything else, and it's probably because I'm super sensitive to this subject. I'm super sensitive to the subject because I struggle with it the most. The thing that I've noticed the most here since we've lived here and the community that we live in is that people that live here, whether they're from here or not, tend to be really negative. 
Does anyone else feel that? It's okay if you don't. I'm going to, hopefully by the end, I'm going to expose some things where we're all guilty of that. Nothing wrong with this area. It's not more negative than any other area, but the first thing that I've noticed, again, because I'm super sensitive to it, because I struggle with it the most out of anyone else that I know, what I've noticed is that people here tend to look at the, the glass as half empty, right, instead of half full. But what I want to challenge us with today is that if we can change our words, then we can change our worlds. If we can change and choose our words carefully, we can determine the type of life that we live. I want to give you this equation here today and kind of walk us through it. First thing is this, is that words, the words that we say, they determine the way that we think. And I know a lot of you might sit here and say, well, actually, I've always kind of thought it to be opposite. In fact, I tell my kids, or, or, or when I'm correcting someone else, I'm like, hey, make sure you think before you speak, right? We all have heard that. But scientists and, and, and psychologists in recent years have determined that while that is still very true, what is more true is that the words that we use determine the way that we think. And I'm going to show you that today. The second part of that equation is this, is that the way that we think determines our behavior. So first step is that the words that we speak, that changes the way that we think. And then, what, what, and then when we change the way that we think, it determines our behavior, what we do with our hands and our feet and how we live our lives and how we go about uh, our daily activities. And the third part is this, is that ultimately our behavior then uh, determines the way that we live. And let me give you an example of that, okay? So the words determine the way that we think. And you're in the office during the week, and you don't like a decision that your boss has made or that your company has made, and you're starting to talk about it with your coworkers, and you're like, this is really awful. I don't know why they're doing this. Who's running the show? Some monkey. Like, who's pulling the trigger on these things? I don't get it. What's going on? And then you move over into that, that those words determine the way that you think, and so then you go home, and you sleep, and you dwell on it, and you're like, you know what, I really, I'm, I just hate my job, and I'm going to go in there tomorrow, and I'm going to tell my boss what I, what I really think of him. And so then on, over here, your behavior then is that you walk into your office, or walk into your boss's office, and you tell him what you really think of them and the decisions that have been made around there, and you're super unkind about it. Are we in agreement that that action right there will ultimately determine how you live, Right? If you walk into your boss's office this week and you tell him what you really think, totally unfiltered, I can promise you it'll change how you live your life because you probably won't have a job anymore, <laughs> right? So we know that the words that we use around the office and in our, in, our, in our community, I'm just using the office as an example, in our worlds, in our community, and wherever we, we dwell and wherever we spend the most time at, for most of us, it is, it is the workplace. So the words that we use in that workplace and the words that we use in that community will ultimately determine the way that we think about it when we leave that area. And that, that thinking, that, that fettering, just, staring, just uh, staying on it, dwelling on it nonstop of, of the words that you've spoken becomes your reality. And then that reality determines your ultimate behavior. And then the behavior will determine how you live your life. And the great part about this is that we're not stuck in this endless cycle of just continually setting ourselves up for failure. No, and uh, Scripture in Romans 12, in the first verse of Romans 12, we know that God tells us if you've been around uh, uh, church or, or, or your faith at, at long enough at all, you know that Romans 12 says, hey, that our act of worship is not coming in here and singing songs and listening to some guy speak and sitting in a chair and giving an offering and taking communion and stand up and sit down. That's a part of it, but it's not the entirety of our worship. Our worship, according to, according to Romans 12, 1, is that we would offer our whole lives, including the way we think, including our behavior, including our words, outside of this building, is offering our whole lives as a living sacrifice. We're not dying uh, physically. We're dying spiritually to ourself and to our own desires, and we're living as a sacrifice for God, right? We know that. That's in Romans 12.1. But in Romans 12.2, it says this, and this is where we're going to land today. It says, don't copy the behavior. Remember how we got to behavior? And the customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person 
by changing the way you think. I want to stop there for a second. When I say that I realize, or, or, or one thing that I've noticed about Central Maryland is that it tends to be a pretty negative place. I don't really know the reason for that, but I know that what I hear the most is um, uh, a lot of lies people tell to themselves. And what they say to themselves is, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'll never be this. I'll always be this. I'll always be a loser. I'll never be a winner. Um, and I can never succeed, and this is the hand that God has dealt me for whatever reason, and so that's how I'm going to live, and I'm just going to sit and dwell in that. But he says here in Romans 12, he says, that's copying the behavior of what the world is telling you. He says, instead of doing that, let's, let's flip that on its head and let, let God, he's saying, let me, let me transform you into a totally new person. Anyone here who has gone from uh, childhood into teen years into early adulthood into full-on adulthood and had kids, how many of you have promised, and it's okay, if your parents are here, you don't have to answer this question, but for the most part, how many of you would say when you got to be an adult, you promised yourself, whether, or you, whether it was out loud or just a, a, de a de declaration in your own mind, you said, hey, I'm not going to be my parents, right? How many? Come on, it's okay. You said, no matter what, they, had, they, may, they may be awesome parents, but they had this one thing about them that just drove me nuts, and no matter what I do in life, I will not be that. In the same passion and fervor that you have for that is the same passion and fervor that God has for you to be someone new and to be transformed into what you think you might be and to what he knows you are. He says this, be transformed into a new person. Say this with me, by changing the way you think. There was a lot of like murmuring there. I wouldn't necessarily say we said it, so let's try that again. By changing the way you think, then, and only then, you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Way better than what we could imagine. You know, in preparation for this message, I was watching a TED Talk from a psychologist who talked about the words that we use and how it shapes the way that we live our lives. And so when I saw that, I'm like, hey, I'm speaking on that. I would love to know from someone who's way smarter than me uh, on this subject. And what she shared in there is that they did, a, they did this really cool test with kids. Anyone have kids in the room ever? They could be kids right now. They could be grown adults by now. But at some point, you had a kid in your life. And so what they did is they took uh, kids... Um, of the age where they learn their, one of the earliest words. And when I say this word, you're going to know exactly what it is, and you're going to say that was either my kid's first word or top five words. And the word is mine. Did you teach them that word? Like seriously, off to the side, did you teach them that word? Because if you did, my kid found out about it, and I'm really upset with you. But seriously, we didn't teach them that word, did we? We didn't sit them down and say, hey, you see all this stuff? Yours. Huh. Say it. Mine. It's easy to say. Learn it with me. You didn't sit down there and train them on what was theirs and what belonged to them and how to use that word. But man, did they know it. They knew it right off the bat. And so these psychologists said, okay, I'm going to take this, these young adolescent brains who really ha don't have a whole lot in them other than the fact that they know what's theirs and they know what's theirs. <laughs> That's pretty much it, right? And so they put these, they put, they put these kids in two rooms. And, in the and each room was filled with every kind of toy that you could imagine for a kid. And you can imagine a kid walks into a room like that and they say, go ahead and play. And what are they going to start doing? Mine, mine, mine. And they start to put all this stuff around them and they're sitting in the middle of it and they're like, not that kid's over there. Don't let him come close to me. I saw that kid. I know that kid. If he gets it, he's going to take it and hide it under his shirt, and he's going to pretend it's his. It's not his. It's mine. You watch him. Watch that kid. Watch him. This is my stuff. Mine. No. Mine. Right? We've seen that? So the kids are in there, and they're like, mine. 
And they walk in, uh, one of the doctors walks in and says, okay, kids, uh, now it's time to share. How do you think that went over? The kid has everything that their little mind could ever conceive that they could possibly ever want in life. Go ahead and clock in the rest of my life. I got it all right here in this little circle of my toys and my stuff. It ain't time to share. It's mine. Needless to say, they did not react kindly to the fact that it was time to share. So they did the same thing in the other room. And the kid, same thing. Let all the kids have all the toys they wanted, play with everything, go nuts. They got their own stuff, and everybody's kind of started to identify what belongs to them and what belongs to who. And, okay, this is my stuff. Let them do that for a while. And they walk in, and they say, okay, kids, it's time to take turns. And you know what they did? They said, go right ahead. And do you know why they did that? Because when you share something, there's no promise of when and if you're ever going to get it back. But when you take turns with something that you have, something that's yours, because you use that word, it's time to take turns, it comes with the promise that if you give this thing away, you're going to get it back. It's an equal thing. There's promise there, right? So the kids, in their mind, they were like, I want to give this thing away as quickly as possible because I know that in the end, I'm going to get it back. And the quicker I can give it to them, the quicker I give it back. You see, two very similar situations. Only thing they did is choose two sets of words. Hey, it's share time. Nope. Hey, it's time to take turns. Go ahead. Right? Do you see the difference? So there are differences in our words, and our words will determine how we live. The Bible says this in Proverbs 18. God made a point of this when he said the tongue, meaning our words, they can bring life, like taking turns, or they can bring death, like sharing. For that kid to share their toys might as well be dead. Worst news ever. So the other kid, taking turns, he's like, go ahead. And in an act of generosity, he did it because he knew that he was going to get it back. Proverbs 21, 23 says this, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity, which means trouble. Like I said earlier, if you walked into your boss's office or your company's executive office or whoever it is that makes the, makes the calls and the decisions, and you told them everything that you really felt about them, and you just spewed out everything without holding anything back, do you think that would cause trouble or life? It would cause trouble. And so that's what he's saying here in Proverbs 21. It says, hey, if you can't guard your mouth, I can promise you it will lead to trouble. And I'm speaking to myself here. I struggle with this more than anyone else I know. I walked in this room this morning uh, not with the best attitude and immediately started saying things that were wrong. And I realized as I was, as I was listening to the, to the worship and listening to the songs as I was getting ready to come up here, I'm like, this is exactly what I'm getting ready to speak on. I walked up in here today and started pointing out everything that was wrong and and, I, and it's not bringing life to me at all. It's only bringing trouble to my mind and to my heart and to my spirit. So I want to give us today three warnings on words. And then on the flip side of that, towards the end, I want to give you three encouragements on words. I don't want to just kind of leave you with, hey, that's what the Bible says. Be careful with your words. See you next week. And you're trying to figure out what to do with it. Three warnings on words. First one is this. And this is the biggest one. Negativity. Negativity. I often tell people this. Again, because it's my biggest struggle. That negativity is the murderer of your worship. Negativity is the murderer of your worship. Or to put it in uh, layman's terms or terms of people who don't really know what worship means um, or people who aren't Christians or, or follow hard after God and, and give their whole lives as worship to God, 
uh, to, put it, to put it in simple terms, uh, negativity is the ultimate party pooper. The ultimate party pooper. Anyone ever been at a party and they're like, man, this is a great time. And someone walks in and is like, kind of wish they had red punch instead of green punch. And you're like, dude, they've got like all you can eat filet mignon and lobster out here, and you're complaining about the color of the punch. I'm like, God, now I want red punch. Thanks. <laughs> right? <laughs> that negativity will murder that good time. It will party poop on it every time. And in the same way, it will party poop on your worship. I have an illustration I want to share with you about that. So, uh, in transition, when we moved from Indiana to here, uh, there are some things that didn't make it. I don't know where they went. If it was just like angel share and somewhere in the process, they were like, I'm taking this and you're never going to have it again. Nothing really big, but some of the things, that, one of the things that didn't make it was our rakes, like raking leaves. And so I decided that I was going to try to find um, a tractor supply. Does anyone know what tractor supply is? Men in here should know what tractor supply is. And if, if you're a man and you don't know what tractor supply is, you're welcome. Go ahead and go to tractor supply on your way home. And just walking in there will ultimately make you feel like more of a man. They have stuff in there that you did not know that you needed, but trust me, you need it. Um, and and it'll, it'll, it'll make you a better man for it. So my son loves to go to tractor supply. When we lived in Indiana, we had tractor supplies everywhere, obviously, because it's just big farm country. And so my son's like, hey, he's been asking me since we got here, like, hey, when are we going to go to the tractor store? We're going to go to the tractor store, and I need this rake. And I'm like, okay, now's finally an opportunity for me to go to the tractor store. I'm like, let me go to this tractor store first and check it out. See, he loves the tractor store because not only do they have, like, Dixie choppers and, and lawnmowers and stuff like riding lawnmowers out front, but they also have, like, four-wheelers and all-terrain vehicles inside that he gets to climb up in and sit there and act like he's driving it all over the place and makes him feel like more of a man. And so he loves the tractor store. And so every chance that we had when we lived in Indiana, we would go to the tractor store. So I said, hey, bud, I think I finally found a tractor store, which, by the way, if you didn't know where it's at, it's on Crane Highway. It took me a while to figure that out, but that's where it's at. It's big. It's clean. It's awesome. Again, guys, go there on your way home. Get that punch in your man card and feel better about yourself. So I said, hey, we need this rake. I'm going to go while he's in school. I'm going to kind of kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to get this rake. His leaves are starting to fall. And I'm also going to check out this tractor supply so I can tell if it's a good one so that I can come back to my son, Ethan, who's eight years old, and tell him, hey, bud, tractor store, found it, awesome, let's go, um, whenever we want. So uh, my little girl, Aubrey, uh, has been telling me since, since, like, August, or she's been asking me since, like, August, when are the leaves going to fall so we can rake them up? And, you know, as a parent, if a kid wants to rake leaves, you're like, go ahead. <laughs> Even if it's not good, you're just like, have at it. And so she's been telling me since August, when, when are we going to rake leaves? When are we going to rake leaves? And she, obviously she wants to rake leaves so that she can jump in the pile and feel like the most amazing kid ever and just wail. And I'm like a, like a snow angel, but instead with leaves, right? And so leaves started falling. We don't have a rake. I'm looking everywhere. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to go to Tractor Supply and find this rake. And I have a picture up here of the rake. And so when I went to the store, I saw this rake. It's just a regular looking rake, right? But it's like, it's like a big throw of a rake, right? So it can catch a lot of leaves. It doesn't weigh a whole lot. So I'm like, okay, this is great. Uh, my little girl and my little boy will both be able to handle this rake. And even if they're not really trying and they just kind of drag it behind them, then even still, uh, they would be able to pick up the leaves and get their little pile going and jump in it. So I'm searching around the store after I kind of made my rounds and looked at all the stuff that I, you know, I just had to have. And I looked at all that stuff, and I kind of felt good about being a man and a husband and a father. It's weird how a place like that will do that for you, but it, it does, trust me. And so I'm standing over there, and I'm looking at the rakes, and I'm just staring at this rake, and I'm just like, man, this rake, this rake is going to do me a lot of good. This rake is awesome, because I'm going to come home with this rake, and my little girl who has been asking me since August to rake leaves, she's going to feel like I just brought Minnie Mouse home to her, and she's going to be like, it's a rake, and she's going to run up to me, and she's going to hug my leg because she's only this tall, and she's going to be like, oh, daddy, thank you. You're the best dad ever, and then she's going to go outside immediately and help her mind her to put on shoes and a jacket because that's what she does, and then she's going to go out there, and she's going to rake leaves and rake leaves into a big pile, and she's going to backwards jump into the leaves, and she's going to have leaves falling all over, and there's going to be like unicorns flying through the air, and fireworks going off that says, you're the best, Dad, and like all this stuff, and all because I brought home 
the rake. And I'm sitting here and I'm staring at this rake and I'm just like, yeah, $15, no question. I'm getting this rake. This rake is mine. And right about that time that I'm having this big party in my head, this guy walks in, walks right up behind me and doesn't even stop. He goes, he sees me staring at the rake and he just goes, that's a pretty good rake till you try to rake leaves with it. <laughs> I'm just like, what? What? Like you just, I was in a whole thing. There was unicorns and fireworks that had my name in it and my girls giving me hugs and I don't, I don't want to know. I don't want the rake. What do you mean? And he just really kind of just, in a moment, it just flipped me in from complete euphoria of this is going to be the greatest purchase of my life for $15. And it just immediately flipped me into like, well, I must not know a thing about rakes. What's he talking about? And obviously, you know, like you look at a rake this big and you know that it's going to get leaves stuck in it. Well, let me tell you, like even like the really awesome rakes where you can like crank a knob and it'll push the leaves out of it, they still get stuck in there, okay? It's a rake, people. That's what rakes do. They rake leaves. You're welcome for the rake that's raked the leaves that's no longer on your grass anymore, okay? So let's just stop complaining about the rake and how, oh, it gets leaves stuck in it. Like it's a rake. That's what it does, right? So I got the rake. I'm telling you what, everything but the unicorns and the fireworks happened. It was awesome. I got home. She loved it. She got the pile. We were Instagramming videos so we could tell everybody what awesome parents we were and what great uh, shots we were getting on Instagram and hashtag this and hashtag greatest life ever and hashtag peed fam. And we're just really having at it. And this is the great. We're doing, doing slow-mo videos of like my son running into it. And it's just the greatest thing ever. But almost, I almost gave in to that negativity. It almost murdered what was about to happen. It almost, it almost took that joy from my life. And in the same way, God says, hey, if you don't be careful with your words, it can really ruin your life. It can really ruin your life. Second thing is this, second warning I want to give you is this, is gossip. Right? Like, I felt like even the same noise happened in the first service. All I said was gossip. And like, there's a, like a, a murmur over the congregation that just kind of, mm, mm. I'm like, that's all I really have to say. Let's move on. I'm just kidding. Um, hey, no, let me just tell you, nothing builds more distrust in a community of people than gossip. And let me just get straight to the point here. If you're not part of the problem or the solution, you shouldn't be talking about it with other people. Flat out. It will ruin it. Proverbs 26, 20 says this, Without wood, a fire goes out. Imagine trying to build this really nice bonfire, but you have no wood, and you're like, you're just throwing your lighter in there, and you're like, fire, it's not working. Like, it goes out. Wood, without wood, a fire goes out, and without a gossip, meaning without someone who gossips, a quarrel or trouble dies down. Without wood, a fire goes out, and without gossip, a quarrel dies dies down. Just stop. Just stop. If you're not part of the problem or the solution, even if you think you're part of the problem, really ask yourself, am I really part of the problem or am I just inserting myself into the problem because I really like being part of problems so that I can solve them and everybody be like, oh, Becky came and she solved her problems. No, like, is it really your problem? Are you really part of the solution? If not, let it go. Third thing is this, slander. It's kind of a biblical word, but basically it just means like talking bad about somebody else, right? So if you're out there and you're just, and you're talking, about, going back to that boss illustration, if you're just talking about your boss around the office and you're just like, that guy's an idiot, anybody could do his job, I should have been promoted over him, there's no way, blah, 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 slander. Is that really useful? Like, I know like you might feel super good about it after you like slander a little bit, like, oh man, it just feels so good. Get that off my chest. I just need to say that. But like at the, at the end of it all, is that really useful? Think about that. I don't think it is. Let me give you three encouragements on words. Here's three ways you can use your words in a good way. Instead of negativity, gossip, and slander, here's three ways you can really use your words in a good way. First one is this, is Praise. And yes, praise of God, we're going to get there in a second, but praise of just people around you. 
You do it on Sunday mornings, even if you don't mean it. I see you, people walk in, and they got a new haircut, and you're like, oh, it's the best haircut ever. And you're like, roll your eyes afterwards, and you're like, not really, what happened to her head? But like, <laughs> you say it, even if you don't mean it. You give praise. And that makes that other person feel good about themselves. In the same way, God wants our praise. Because he knows that the whole reason we're here to begin with is him. And so if we could just offer him up a little bit of lip service, even if sometimes we don't mean it, ultimately he wants us to mean it, right? Ultimately he wants our heart in those words. But sometimes we have to, again, have our words determine the way that we think, which determines our behavior ultimately, right? And so he says this uh, in Psalm 63, one of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. He says, because your love is better than life. This is the psalmist David talking about God. He says, God, because your love is better than life itself, my lips physically will glorify you, meaning my words and the things that I say, they will bring you glory. Second thing is this, love. A few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to hear uh, a cool reading of this, uh, of the love chapter, and if you don't, if you don't uh, know what that is, if, if you're new to Bible or the faith, the love chapter is simply this. It's, it's 1 Corinthians 13, the first uh, handful of verses or so talk about love, and so if you ever hear when you say like, oh, go to the love chapter, it's 1 Corinthians 13. There you learned something today. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth, meaning words, right? If I could speak all the languages of not just earth, but also of heaven and the angels, but I didn't love other people, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, meaning it wouldn't mean a thing. It would be lip service and all talk and there's no life in that, right? There's no life in that. Third thing is this, goodness. Philippians 4.8 says this. Get ready to read again. It'll be on the screen for you. I'll, I'll let you know when it's your turn. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Eight different things, eight different takeaways today. Like, I, I don't know what to think about, I don't know what to say. There's eight things right here. Say something true, say something noble, say something right, say something pure, say something lovely, say something admirable, say something excellent, say something praiseworthy. He says this, and say this with me. Think about such things. And what he's ultimately saying, if we're, if, if we're taking that equation from earlier, because thinking is the, middle, is the middle part of the equation, is he's saying, hey, in order to think about such things, really what it gets down to is you need to say such things. You need to let those things come off your lips and not... You don't understand my family tree or my dad or my kid or my mom or my wife or my husband. They're the worst. And let me tell you 18 reasons why they're the worst. Shut it down. Stop it. It will not bring you life. So what do we do with all this? We're like, okay, words, I get it. They're super important. I should be thinking about my words. I tell my kid all the time, hey, think before you speak. I get it. it's a little bit different that the words determine the way that we think. Okay, I got that big idea. But even more than that, what now, God? What do we do with this? I want you to write these things down if you have the ability to do that, even if it's in your phone. Like, phones are okay here. Just don't be that guy that, like, the ringer goes off nonstop. But, like, you can pull out your phone, open up a note in your phone, and just, and just write this out, okay? I want you to take note on this of mental or physical, uh, uh, of whether it be mental or physical note, I want you to take note of the words that you use this week, okay? And I want you to ask yourself these three questions this week when you find yourself using words and you kind of catch yourself talking a lot okay and i want you to ask yourself these three things first thing is this are they positive or negative meaning your words are my words positive or are my words negative second thing are they building up are they speaking life into somebody else into a situation or are they tearing down third thing is this are they for something? Or do they lean towards being against something? 
So many times we turn on the TV here, and I haven't watched the local news in forever because of this very reason, because it's super negative, right? Like everything that you hear is somebody's against this, and somebody's against this, and now this person's offended, and now I'm offended that they're offended, and now so now there's, big, there's this big chaos that's happening. And whatever side of the political spectrum you fall on, can you understand this? We as Christians, as humans, but even more so as Christians, we should be known for what we are for, not what we're against. When all is said and done and your life is over, there's, for most of us, there's not going to be a book written about us. And so for most of us at our memorial service, there are going to be a few people that get up and they say a few words. And I want you to think about, and you've probably heard this before, hey, think about what you want to have said at your funeral. Think about the dash on your tombstone, what that was really meant about. But what I really want you to think about is when people think about you, whether it be now or after you're gone, they think about you. They, would they say that you're a person who is for something, that that person stood for something? Or would they say that person was against everything? I never met anyone who had so many enemies and so many things that they were against. Think about these things when you're using your words this week. I want to leave us with this passage. We read it earlier. Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. The behavior, right? We know what leads us there. Our behavior is from the way that we think and our thoughts are from the words that we use. So let's not use the same words. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but... Read this with me. Let God transform you. You can be changed. You can be different. You don't have to be stuck in the mud. Your life is not meaningless. Your life has purpose. God has a plan for you, and he wants that life for you so desperately. And he says, look, if you will just change the way that you talk just a little bit, instead of being so negative all the time, if you would just be a little bit more positive, I can get a light, I can get a foot in the door, and I can show you. I can show you the life that I have for you. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then and only then, you will learn to know God's will for you. And listen to this, which is good, not bad. It's pleasing, it's not unpleasant. And it's perfect. It's perfect. His plan for you is perfect. Your plan for you sucks. His plan for you, perfect. And he wants that for you, but you've got to give him a foot in the door. And it starts with our words. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful that you're, that you're, that not only your word is perfect, but even goes further than that into, in some, into some action. God, that your, that your will for each one of us is perfect. What, what great surrender there is in that for each one of us today. Our plans are awful. The way we see things, God, help us to see them the way you see them good and pleasing and perfect. Yeah, that's what I want. That's what we desire. Change us so that we can change the world around us. It starts with us. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, Please remember, you belong at ACC.